Now, in this half hour of our continuing coverage of this solemn anniversary, we're going to give you a look at the state of America's security, what's been learned, what's being done differently, what hasn't been done, and what the American people think about how it is all being handled. The word came yesterday on the eve of 9-11 that President Bush was boosting the nation's terror alert status from yellow, that was significant, to the status of orange, that's the second highest level, and signals officially a, quote, high risk of terrorist attack on American targets here or abroad. The only higher category is red, which is imminent danger, if you will. Now, as for why the U.S. government felt compelled to impose a code orange. Let's go to CBS News correspondent Jim Stewart in Washington. Jim? Dan, the United States went to code orange based on information that it received from an al-Qaeda operative uh, that was captured sometime in Java about two months ago. Uh, meanwhile, I think we should clear up a report that uh, we came out earlier in which we said that an al-Qaeda website uh, had thought to reflect uh, the views of al-Qaeda was running an eyewitness account of the death of Osama bin Laden in a U.S. bombing raid last December. That account, it now appears, was a fake, and the entire article was a tease. It concluded, in fact, that bin Laden is still alive, according to our translator, and offers no new information on his health or whereabouts. It appears to be the latest in a series of teases about bin Laden that have surfaced. Earlier, Al Jazeera, an Arabic television station, reported that a senior al-Qaeda official had referred to bin Laden in the past tense. And U.S. officials say they now believe the station has another tape it has not released. Officials do not know whether that tape contains new information about bin Laden or not. This afternoon, Al Jazeera said it does not have such a tape. The bottom line is that on the anniversary of 9-11, the U.S. still doesn't know the status of the man it believes planned these attacks, and al-Qaeda appears to be taking full advantage of that. Dan. Uh, Jim Stewart, uh, double-check me here, true or untrue, that of the five people, including Osama bin Laden, who are generally recognized to be the five most important in al-Qaeda, the U.S. government feels it has confirmed the death of one, one out of that five. That is correct, Dan. It cannot account for the whereabouts of the others. Uh, you may recall that a senior FBI official, uh, the man who heads their counterterrorism program, in fact, has stated publicly that he believes bin Laden is dead. There's been a tremendous amount of speculation that uh, Aman Zawahiri, the number two man in al-Qaeda, is, is dead as well. Neither of those facts, obviously, uh, confirmed. Uh, what has a appears to be true, though, is that the number three man in al-Qaeda, uh, the man who, in fact, planned the 9-11 uh, operation, is still alive and, and has been seen, or at least heard of, we should say, on uh, television in, uh, in the Middle East. Dan? Jim Stewart, live in Washington, for what the U.S. military is doing under the Code Orange terrorist alert. We take you to CBS News National Security correspondent David Martin who's reporting live from the Pentagon. David? Well, Dan, we still have anti-aircraft missile batteries uh, stationed at various places around Washington, including here at the uh, Pentagon. And, and there are two uh, incidents which the U.S. is now investigating to see if they are uh, threats or just uh, bad jokes and hoaxes. One is the mailing of uh, letters containing an unidentified white powder to a number of American embassies and consulates in Europe. Those embassies have been closed and the mail room sealed off and they are now uh, doing the tests that you need to, to do to identify those uh, powders and when we find out what those tests show we will try to report that. The other one is this uh, mysterious case of the Liberian uh, flagship, uh, flag tanker that is uh, off the uh, coast of New Jersey. It was uh, sent there six miles off the coast after the uh, Coast Guard boarded it and uh, found traces of radioactive material with its uh, uh, detection equipment. Uh, that remains a very suspicious situation because there were other things uh, that were suspicious about this vessel. Its paperwork was not in order. Uh, the Coast Guard thought they saw signs or heard signs of stowaways on the ship. One of the crew uh, had actually tried to enter the United States before and been turned back because he was a suspicious person. So that ship has now been taken six miles off the coast of 
uh, New Jersey and is being searched by experts from the Department of Energy for any sign of nuclear material. But this could take quite some time. There are 655 containers on that chip, Dan. Uh, David, let me follow up with a question that I hear a lot of people asking. I, I don't hear it asking in hostile fashion at all, but it is, you know, how is the war, how's the war in Afghanistan going? I think the frame of reference is that nearly everybody had a sense that once the U.S. military moved in Afghanistan, it accomplished with breathtaking speed two major objectives. It removed the Taliban from power, and it clearly crushed the infrastructure of al-Qaeda. But then, and the New York Times, among other papers, has, has said this, that there has been at least the appearance that, say, sometime since early December, that the war has been in a kind of stasis, that we've been kind of bogged down there. Now, people in the Pentagon hear this. What's their reaction to that? Well, I think uh, bogged down is probably not the right word. What, what you hear in the Pentagon is that the, the effort in Afghanistan is reaching the point of diminishing returns. They're sending uh, uh, a thousand soldiers out on a sweep through a part of southern Afghanistan, and they come back with uh, precious little. They usually find uh, a few more caches of weapons. They arrest uh, a few more people, who most of whom are later let go. And then on the other hand, you have these occasional incidences of uh, friendly fire where the U.S. Uh, returns fire from a village or wherever it took fire from and ends up killing civilians, which, of course, is uh, counterproductive and, and also an obvious tragedy. And they are wondering if, if they have somehow lost their focus uh, on this war, plus the fact that the major figures in al-Qaeda no longer seem to be in Afghanistan. They either seem to uh, be on the other side of the border in uh, Pakistan, or they seem to be uh, further away in places like uh, Iran, Iraq, uh, and, uh, and Yemen. And the U.S. is trying to figure out, okay, how do we go get these guys? If that is the, the core of al-Qaeda, the people who can still direct uh, attacks against the United States, who still know where the money is to finance them, those are the guys we've got to get. And running around Afghanistan, uh, policing up these arms caches, isn't really going to do much in terms of forestalling future terrorist attacks. David Martin at the Pentagon, thanks. CBS News Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is here with more on what President Bush is doing today as he moves from ceremony to ceremony. John? Well, Dan, uh, going back to the uh, the threat that uh, Jim Stewart and David Martin were talking about, it was the president uh, who made the decision to go from uh, code yellow to code, code orange uh, back on Monday night after he was presented with intelligence that uh, picked up a lot of that uh, same sort of chatter, as the intelligence community likes to talk about it, that they were picking up prior to September 11th of last year. The, much of it was overseas. And it, and it might be beneficial for us right now to, to pause for a moment and show the audience this, uh, this threat assessment uh, warning system system uh, that the White House and the Department of Homeland Security uh, use to uh, tell law enforcement uh, officials across the country uh, kind of what threat we're under. It's a five-stage system, uh, five different colors, begins with green, which is an all-clear, blue, which is a guarded condition, yellow, which is an elevated state of alert, which is what we've been in for the last six months since the... Uh, uh, the threat warning system was uh, established. Uh, an orange uh, alert, which is high, which we're at now, and then severe, which pretty much means that uh, the nation is is under attack. Uh, the precautions that the White House took uh, as a result of this were to move Dick Cheney back to a secure location. Uh, the vice president, to the best of my recollection, recollection, has not been in what was referred to as the cave uh, since his coming out back uh, in early February for the State of the Union address. But he's back there now. He spent the last two nights there. He'll spend today there and probably tonight as well. Uh, they've also taken uh, precautions, the State Department this is, uh, with embassies around the world closing down nine of them temporarily, just uh, shuttering the doors, but uh, embassies in Indonesia and Malaysia have been closed until further notice. Some other actions that have been taken, federal buildings here in New York and across the country uh, have seen security precautions there, They're putting up barricades, uh, the uh, tunnels and bridges uh, in New York are under increased surveillance. There are combat air patrols flying over 10 cities across America, uh, flying 24 hours a day over New York City. We hear the F-16s uh, up in the air uh, occasionally here, and as well in Washington. 
And uh, for the first time that I know of, Dan, correct me on this if I'm wrong, uh, surface-to-air missile batteries have been set up in Washington, D.C., uh, one of them right outside the Pentagon to protect against attack there. Now, President Bush says that there is no specific threat to America, but they are taking everything here very seriously. So that's why we see this heightened state of alert and these heightened security precautions as the president makes his way here to New York City. Dan? John Roberts with us here in lower Manhattan around Ground Zero. Along with pursuing the war on terrorism triggered by the events of last September 11th, President Bush has been forcefully pushing for a new war against Iraq to oust Saddam Hussein from power. As a result, feelings are running high in Baghdad, as you might imagine. CBS News veteran foreign correspondent Mark Phillips is in Baghdad. Mark? Dan, I have to tell you that I'm speaking to you from, given the belligerent noises being made in Washington and some other places, from a remarkably calm and businesslike uh, Baghdad here tonight. And when I say businesslike, there's a lot of business being done here. The town is awash in consumer goods. You can buy any car, any computer. There's plenty of food around. Basically, if you want to buy it, you can do it here in Baghdad. But I can tell you as well that, as you might expect, the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks are being noted in quite a different uh, way here. In fact, there was just an official announcement on Iraqi television just a few minutes ago summing up uh, government policy, and I've jotted down a few of the salient points, and they do make interesting reading. Uh, the attacks here are being interpreted for public consumption as very much the result, they say, of uh, American foreign policy, that basically, according to the Iraqi line, America got what it deserved on that day. Interestingly, though, they then talk about a declared war on behalf of the United States against Arabs and Muslims, the launching of an aggressive war in Afghanistan, uh, how the attacks showed that the U.S. security is in fact a lot more fragile than it was meant, than it was made out previously to be, and interestingly again, how the Bush administration is using the attacks, the Iraqis say, to distract the American public uh, from the financial scandals of the past few months. Uh, if there was an opening uh, in the uh, official government line here, it was very much that a call for reasonable discussion. Uh, we're very get much getting a good cop, bad cop uh, reaction from the Iraqis uh, with respect to uh, the threats of regime change, uh, as it's uh, been called. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the foreign minister talking about uh, how this can be resolved through the UN. The Iraqis, as we know, have said they're open to the idea, uh, perhaps, of UN arms inspectors uh, coming back in. Uh, they protest their innocence day and night uh, on the issue of weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, and nuclear. They say they aren't preparing any. They're prepared to have the inspectors come back in, but only, they say, as part of a comprehensive deal that, among other things, lifts sanctions, and that's the snag uh, uh, right now. On the other hand, we're getting the vice president here saying that any attack here uh, would logically and necessarily be followed by an uprising across the Arab world against U.S. interests here and elsewhere. So the good cop, bad cop thing and a very, very different look a year later at the September attacks, Dan. Mark Phillips, I know you agree with uh, Mark Twain who said the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between fire and firefly. I say that as a preference to asking, and I hope which is not a, a, a gentle spirit, you said that response uh, to pres the President Bush's or America's, quote, belligerence. Now, of course, what Washington s sees it is a kind of quiet determination to do what President Bush feels the United States must do. Is the word belligerence, is that one that the Iraqi government has been attaching to Washington and President Bush's policy as a way of getting their propaganda across the Arab world? Well, it, I haven't heard the word belligerence, but I have heard the word uh, used again tonight of American arrogance. Uh, it's a phrase we've heard before, and we're hearing it again, that uh, American hegemony in this part of the world, the American desire to control uh, the oil supply coming from this part of the world and that kind of thing. Uh, and talk about, as seen from here, uh, the isolation, they say, of the United States. So we'll say the, the reluctance on the part of most of uh, the U.S. allies in Europe and elsewhere uh, to fully embrace uh, the Bush idea uh, of an aggressive regime change uh, here involving the military, of course, uh, has played very well into the official line here. Uh, they describe Bush and to some extent Tony Blair in Britain as isolated. Uh, as a result of the belligerence. But I haven't actually heard uh, uh, 
that sort of word. I'll also say that the, you know, th these sorts of crises take a long time building here. I've been here for several of them, other people uh, as well. And the sense very much in the town now is of a very distant uh, war drumbeat, uh, if one at all. There's still some hope here, I think, that, that this crisis can somehow be diverted and there's still lots of talking and jawing to be done before any potential war happens. Also, that given the state of the Iraqi economy now, which on the consumer level is quite healthy, as I was saying earlier, this place is just filled with consumer goods. You want it, you can buy it here. Uh, nobody's starving. There's plenty of food around. There's very little interest uh, on the part of the Iraqi regime now in fighting a kind of war. They don't, they don't have to distract uh, their public from hardships at home. Uh, and there is some sense here, at least on the street, that this is not a war the government wants. And here, generally, the government gets what it wants. Dan. Mark Phillips reporting live from Baghdad. We've been running some public opinion surveys, some polls, if you will, on what the American people are thinking about the events of this day, the events of the last year, and the prospect of a new war with Iraq. And Ed Bradley has the results of it. Dan, on this uh, first anniversary of September 11th, Americans are concerned that terrorists could strike again in the United States. Our CBS News New York Times polls show that Almost 70% of Americans believe that it is very likely or somewhat likely that there will be another terrorist attack. And a large number of Americans are worried about their own safety. Now, while the president's job approval remains high, there is growing concern about how he is handling the war against terrorism. 52% of those polled think that the administration is simply reacting to terrorism while 39% believe he has a clear plan to fight it. And, Dan, a separate poll shows that 82% of New Yorkers feel that this city has changed since September 11th. How? Well, people, we're told, are nicer and less arrogant than we used to be. But they also say that New Yorkers are more uneasy, more fearful. And we're told that New Yorkers are concerned about another attack. And a large ma majority believe that they will have to live with terrorism as a daily part of their lives. Most New Yorkers say they do plan to continue living in this city, although that number is down somewhat from last year. And lastly, in a city that some considered cold and unfriendly, 86% of New Yorkers told us if that, that if there was an emergency, that they are confident today that their neighbors would help them out. And, Dan, that's quite a change. You remember the story of Kitty Genovese in 1964 out in Kew Gardens, Queens. This woman was attacked on the street. Her neighbors looked out the window, saw and heard what was going on. She was killed. No one came to her help. Today, people feel that if something happened, their neighbors would help them. And a significant change, at least in this city. Thanks, Ed. I want to take you back to visually Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It's a touch base, touch in there. The reminder of the president and the first lady, Laura Bush, are going down the line at their own pace, with no haste, making the point that the families of those who died aboard Flight 93 in Pennsylvania have the thanks of a grateful nation, and that they, too, are also very much in our minds and hearts today. As the President and First Lady do that, we welcome here to our CBS News broadcasting position right at the edge of the pit here at Ground Zero, Mr. Joe Albaugh, who is the director of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Nice to see you again. Thank you, Dan. You know, we've talked before that FEMA is one of those federal agencies that if it, whatever it does, it's going to get criticism. What do you consider to be the most unfair criticism leveled at FEMA thus far? You've done tremendous work, a lot of good work. I don't know that there are any really unfair criticisms. People need to uh, think about how long it's going to take to get everyone back on their feet. This isn't going to happen overnight. We'll be here for years to come. Let me tell you, Dan, the Northridge earthquake happened in the early 90s. We still have a presence in Southern California. Uh, we will be here in New York, uh, regardless of how much it costs, how long it takes. And I think everyone needs to understand that 
What FEMA does is essentially represent all that's good and great about America coming to our neighbors in time of need. And that's what we do. Whatever it is, we do it. And that's what the president told me on September 11th a year ago. Whatever it takes, do it. Now, as we proceed in the war on terrorism, we go through times such as this raising up to an orange alert. What's FEMA's role as the war lengthens out now? Well, our regional offices are very active. We're active at headquarters. Americans needs to, need to take solace in the fact that we're doing all that we need to do. I don't want to talk about particulars, but we're doing what we need to do. We're better prepared than we were a year ago. We're taking necessary steps to educate the entire population to be better prepared tomorrow. Am I satisfied with where we are today? Not yet, but we're on the right track. Now, FEMA steps in with times of emergency such as hurricanes and floods. Is it or is it not a case that you're going to have less money to do that because we understandably have to give so many resources to the war on terrorism? We'll always have the money that we need to respond to any type of disaster, whether Mother Nature created it or by man-made creation. Uh, the president, this president, is... Uh, understands firsthand how important FEMA is. I've yet to meet a member of Congress that doesn't realize how important FEMA is. I'm anxious to go into the new Department of Homeland Security. That's where we need to be. We need to be the nexus, the focal point of leading the other federal agencies in this, this new age. We have to do a better job, and we will do a better job. Well, well I want to return to Shanksville, Pennsylvania, and some of these photographs, these pictures, live pictures from Shanksville. And as we look at them, this is the field of the so-called impact area. You're a fellow Texan. You've known this president for some time. You must talk to him. And I'm not asking you to reveal anything private, not at this stage anyway. You. Thank you. But give us some sense. What does he talk to you about when he, he is, talks about this war? He's, uh, he's sharing with those individuals the empathy of this nation to reassure them that they are not going through this grieving time alone. Uh, yes, it's tough. And he's reassuring those individuals that he will take the actions necessary to catch the culprits, to eradicate as much as possible terrorism, and we'll do it together as a nation. And he understands exactly why he's the president. I'm fortunate to call him my friend, but I'm so grateful he's the president during these tough times. Have you ever heard him express any frustration that at just the time we need to have the economy surging forward, that it's it's had a decline. No, I've never heard him connect those two. No, I've never heard him say that. Uh, he is focused on moving the entire nation forward together. He has a huge task, and with Congress's help, he'll get it done. I want to return to FEMA and its work. I haven't run across anybody who said this lately, but for somebody who may be out there saying, you know, let me tell you, I have a beef with FEMA, or I've got a problem with FEMA. What do you tell them to do? See the regional office call you? No, 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 no. Uh, when I come across them personally, I take their name, phone number down, address, and, and try to find out exactly what took place. I run across a lot of people who have a beef with FEMA. And we try to uh, improve whatever it is. Keep in mind, when Congress designed FEMA originally, they had no idea something like this would take place. And I'm just thankful as an American that uh, something like FEMA exists to come in and help coordinate state and local responses. And the thing that irritates me the most, firefighters, police officers, are always the first in line for budget cuts and they're the last in line for appreciation. That has to change in our country. We know what to do in the emergency management community. We need the resources to get it done. We're short on time here, but you raise an interesting point. Police departments, sometimes, they may be among the last, they sometimes get what they ask for. Firefighters and fire departments are always at the very end of the line, first thing cut at city hall. Well, let me tell you why, Dan. Because when that bell rings, they'll always show up, regardless of what kind of manpower they're staffed at currently, or what kind of equipment uh, they have, and how old it is. They'll always show up. So elected officials think they can take fire departments and put them on the back burner. No more. Enough is enough. Oh, well, Director of FEMA, Good thanks for being you, with us today. Thank you, I Dan. remember when you came down here early just after this happened. Thanks for what you do. do. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching continuing CBS News coverage of 9-11, the day that changed America. Joe, thank you very much. I'm sorry about this.
want to know what it means to you to be an American. Food Lion, Volunteer TV, and B97.5 are working to support education in East Tennessee. To you, what does it mean to be an American? If you're between the ages of 13 and 17, tell us in 750 words or less what it means to you to be an American. Send your entry to this address. Do it by September 27th, and you could win a savings bond worth up to $1,000 from Food Lion, B97.5, and WVLT Volunteer TV. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. But make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Volunteer TV News this afternoon, September 11th, a year after a tragic day that will be forever in our memories. I'm Liz Tadone. First today, though, mold problems at Blunt County's Heritage High School is shutting the place down. Blunt County's Board of Education made the call at a special meeting on Tuesday night. The school will be closed for 20 days. Students will report back to class Monday, October 14th. In the meantime, crews will move into the building to try to rectify the mold problem. The number of human cases of West Nile virus in Tennessee has increased by three. There are now 23 confirmed cases in people. State Health Department spokeswoman Diane Denton says the latest cases include a 17-year-old and two adults ages 70 and 79. All are male and all are from Shelby County. 19 of the 23 confirmed or probable cases are from Shelby County, and there have been four deaths, all men over the age of 70 from West Tennessee. Two were from Shelby County and one each from Haywood and Weekly counties. Well, East Tennesseans have responded from last year's tragedy by turning the anniversary into a day of caring. This morning, hundreds of United Way volunteers gathered at the Civic Coliseum for the kickoff breakfast. Throughout East Tennessee, volunteers will be participating in different projects. In East Knoxville this morning, WVLT, Volunteer TV's Alan Williams, Shirley Nash Pitts, Kyla Yarbrough, and Paul Clack of Home Depot helped plant a flower garden. Instead of focusing directly on, you know, the negative of the tragedy, we're, the positives of the tragedy is to care for the people in the community and to do positive things and things that's needed in the community. And what's needed is you know, like pl painting or planting flowers. We needed flowers to beautify a building, and that's what Channel 8 has done for us. Tonight on WVLT Volunteer TV News at 5.30, Alan will bring us a story how East Tennessee volunteers are taking time out of their day to care for the community. Well, a vivid reminder of the 9-11 attacks is part of a memorial to be dedicated in Oak Ridge later this afternoon. Two 10-foot steel girders pulled from the rubble at Ground Zero made their way to East Tennessee back in July. Now they are part of a permanent memorial. At 2 o'clock today, firefighters and police officers will join students in dedicating the beams at Oak Ridge High School. We'll have more on the dedication tonight on WVLT Volunteer TV News at 5.30. Well, for John and Pat Lenore, the past year has been very painful. It's all of those emotions, uh, mad, bitter, angry, uh, confused, upset. The Lenores lost their son Rob in the attack on the World Trade Center last year, and tonight on WVLT Volunteer TV News at 6, they'll describe how they have made it through the past year. We are also going to show you how thousands of East Tennesseans are now taking part in the United Way's Day of Caring. So many people doing so many good deeds. We will see you back here tonight at 5.30. We'll also tell you how law agencies have changed the way they do business here in Tennessee since September 11th. Try to make it a good day. We'll see you at 5.30. This CBS News special report is part of our continuing coverage of 9-11, the day that changed America. From Ground Zero in New York, here is Dan Rather. And for those of you just joining us or perhaps rejoining us from earlier, welcome. For those of you who've been with us right straight through, welcome back after that short break to CBS News continuing coverage of the first anniversary of 9-11, the day that changed America. I'm here at the edge of the pit at Ground Zero with Ed Bradley. President Bush is still in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, greeting families of those who died in the crash of the plane that went down there. The president is expected to be leaving there fairly shortly. He'll be coming to New York. Now, in this half hour, we expect to have the ceremonies ended in Shanksville. 
We'll have a remarkable story of survival, courage. It's a very special story of a band of New York firefighters and what they experienced on 9-11. It is not just another firefighter story. It is something special. But first, we want to consider the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. It's now believed that the hijacked United Airlines flight that crashed in Pennsylvania last September 11th had as its intended target the Congress of the United States, specifically the assassins wanted to crash the plane into the Capitol. Joining us now with more on that is CBS News Chief Washington Correspondent and veteran Capitol Hill Observer Bob Schieffer. Bob? Thank you very much, Dan. And <clears throat> I must say that is not very far out of the minds of anyone here uh, on Capitol Hill as, uh, as we go through this day. Uh, there were, really was a certain skittishness here, uh, people thinking about that. Last night, uh, when the Secretary of Defense announced that uh, there would be uh, anti-aircraft missiles placed around Washington and they were, would be armed. I think it sort of added to the uh, skittishness uh, of the moment. But be that as it may, it's been a kind of a quiet and reserved day. Uh, on the uh, floor of the Senate today at uh, high noon, there was uh, a moment of silence in remembrance of the uh, people who uh, died on 9-11. There will be another little ceremony about 5.30 this afternoon. Uh, on the uh, steps of the Capitol. But I think if there's anything that illustrates uh, what has uh, been going on here uh, in Washington and at the Capitol and how it's changed since 9-11, it is what is going on outside the Capitol on what we call the east front of the Capitol. It is a huge construction site there now, Dan, because uh, what is taking place is they are constructing a $368 million underground tunnel which will be the way that most people will now come into the Capitol. It's a project that's going to take four or five years to complete, but it is a way that uh, people can be brought in, the tourists can be brought in, screened underground, a secure way that Americans will still be able to see the main symbol of their freedom, and that is the Capitol of the United States. But right now, behind the Capitol, it's like uh, a giant construction project. You may be able to hear some of the uh, noise going on behind me uh, right now. So uh, that kind of illustrates, uh, in, in a very graphic way, uh, what has been going on here and how much this place has changed since 9-11. Because up until 9-11, of course, the Capitol was a place where people could come in. Uh, it was the last place in Washington where you could come in. Uh, and see the government in action without any kind of special appointment. They stopped most of the tours, did not uh, begin them again until this summer. There was a time, Dan, when as many as, what, 18,000 people a day would come into the Capitol. Only now are they uh, beginning to come back. And when the tourists stopped coming, it was a tremendous blow uh, to the economy of Washington, which depends so heavily on uh, uh, tourism for its economy. So it's a changed place here, Dan, but this is a day that uh, everyone here, there's a special meaning for all of us. Bob, we said at the beginning of this day, we wanted our coverage to be about remembrance, honor, honor the dead, honor those heroes who gave so much in September 11th, and looking ahead. Looking ahead, briefly, has the anthrax threat been completely removed around the Capitol? receded, or is it still very much a, a topic of conversation on the minds of our members of Congress? Oh, it's very much a topic of conversation, Dan, for the simple reason that uh, most people here think that they're no closer to knowing who caused it uh, or where it came from than they were in those days uh, when the anthrax was first discovered. Uh, this, uh, this hit the Capitol uh, with a terrible impact because Senator Bill Frist, who is also a medical doctor, told me one day to just, he said, to understand the enormity of what happened here, he said there was enough anthrax in the one letter that was sent here to Senator Daschle that had it gotten into the ventilation system, it could well have killed everybody in the Hart office building. And there are about 3,000 people, more than half the members of the Senate, more than 50 senators and their staffs were headquartered in that building. Enough anthrax in that one envelope to kill everyone had it gotten into the ventilation system. And again, I stress, they still don't know where it came from, and people here say they're no closer to knowing than they were in those first days after that. Bob Schieffer, live, reporting from the Capitol. Ed Bradley has something to go into now, Ed. Well, Dan, uh, in Shanksville, President Bush is uh, still greeting family members who 
gathered there to remember the 40 passengers and crew who died on United Flight 93. And joining us from near the crash site is Jury Longman, the author of Among the Heroes, an account of the flight's harrowing final moments. Uh, Mr. Longman, thank you very much for joining us. You, you say in your book that the hijackers of the flight picked the wrong plane to hijack, that the passengers were a group of people who were not docile. We had talked about it earlier. What made these people so special? Well, Ed, uh, you know, this flight left 40 minutes late from Newark and went all the way to Cleveland before turning around, so the passengers and crew members had time to make phone calls and opportunity to find out what was happening on the other flights and, and time to do something about it. Uh, they, they were people with a varied group of skills that could have come to the fore that day. We know about the four or five athletes uh, who made phone calls. Uh, there was a man named Donald Green who had a pilot's license, a man named Andrew Garcia who had trained as an air traffic controller. There was a federal agent aboard, Richard Guadagno. Three women, uh, Lauren Grancolas, Linda Gronlin, and Jean Peterson were emergency medical technicians. CeCe Lyles, one of the flight attendants, had been a former policewoman. So you had a group of people who were professionally trained to be calm and decisive in times of stress. And these were people who knew what was going on. And my understanding is that there was an announcement mistakenly over the in the cabin of the plane that the plane was being hijacked. And at that point, they called, they made phone calls out? They began making, well, as soon as they saw what was happening, several minutes later, they began making uh, phone calls. And I mean, I presume that the people on the other three hijacked planes that day would have made the same valiant attempt if they had had the opportunity. But this is the one flight where they, because it went so far west and took off so late, where they had time to learn quickly that this was not a uh, you know, normal hijacking, that it was likely a suicide mission, and so quickly, you know, they had 30 minutes from the time it was hijacked until it crashed, so within that quick period, they made a plan and attempted to regain control of the plane. Mm. In your book, you seem to indicate some confusion over the number of hijackers. Most of the passengers appear to have only seen three, but you're saying that there were four? Four had been identified. Uh, the other three flights that day had had, had five hijackers. Um, and four were identified, but it's an intriguing uh, and unanswered question about why all the phone calls refer to only three hijackers. There are a number of possibilities. Uh, some investigators have explained to me the most likely answer is that eyewitness testimony is unreliable in times of stress, and in the confusion of the moment, uh, they may not have seen all four at one time. From the interviews that you conducted, from listening to the tapes, as best you can, can you tell us the facts of the of the takeover? Yeah, I, I should say I did not hear the tapes myself, but I, I talked to government officials who had and to family members who were allowed to hear the tape and take notes. Uh, the, the final five minutes of the flight, there was a fierce struggle, uh, screaming in English and Arabic. Uh, Family members said you could hear words like cockpit and words to the effect, if we don't get into the cockpit, we'll die. Crashing sounds of, appear to be dishes and perhaps glass. Uh, and uh, when they gathered to hear the t t tape in April, a federal prosecutor told the family members it's his theory that they actually, passengers actually broke into the cockpit using a food cart as a battering ram. Uh, it's, that's a theory, it's not definitive, and it's unclear as to whether, if they broke in, uh, whether the hijackers crashed the plane on purpose or whether it crashed in the chaos of the moment as they were fighting for control. That's just one thing we don't know at this point. Do you have a sense if there was a leader among the hijackers? Uh, we don't know. Oh, among the hijackers. Well, the, the uh, man named Ziad Jarrah has been identified on that flight as the, uh, the hijacker pilot. And in recent uh, revelations by the German government uh, have, have said that he... Uh, Jarrah trained uh, in Afghanistan with, with Mohammed Atta, the, the ringleader of the, uh, the 19 hijackers, in Afghanistan in late 1999. And he came to, uh, Jarrah came to South Florida at about the same time that Atta did in uh, the summer of 2000. So he appeared to be the leader uh, on that flight. Mr. Longman, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Dan, it looks like uh, President Bush is uh, starting to to make his way out of uh, Shanksville. Difficult to leave, it looks like. Definitely about to leave, and he'll be flying here to New York, where he will spend time. Of course, he'll address the nation tonight at 9 Eastern, 8 Central, from Ellis Island here in New York. Well, as we watch the president say goodbye in Shanksville, we welcome to our CBS News broadcast position here on the edge of the pit and ground zero. 
Bill Langovicia, who was a writer for Atlantic Monthly magazine, he started a series of articles in the magazine in July, it's my understanding, we ended in October. These are articles uh, in a Pulitzer nomination category, and we congratulate you for them. When did you start writing this material? I started writing them in the sense, uh, writing is, you know, you have to go there first, so I arrived about three days after the building came down. Well, this is what you call the unbuilding, just after the unbuilding of the World Trade Center. It's not the story of 9-11, it's the story of what happened afterward, which is a much more positive thing. It's a story of a physical, practical, all-American response here at the site. Well, I certainly am not going to ask you to paraphrase long and a series of articles, but in essence, what is that untold story? The untold story, the, the real act of genius here, and it was an act of genius, was to allow the people who responded to run with the ball. These are unexpected people who came forth, and he rose to power here inside the perimeter who did this job out behind us. They were not people who were expected before. And most other systems, I believe, would have shoved them aside, would have put experts in charge, or would have brought the army in, that sort of thing. These were ordinary people who were very energetic, very talented, and the American system had the intelligence to let them run. Well, certainly we have our weaknesses as a people, but among our strengths historically have been Americans are builders and rebuilders. And yes, we play team pretty well. Is that what happened here? It was, in that sense, yes, because it was practical, it was physical, it was moving debris, it was lifting things to find survivors and then to find the dead. It was a very, in that sense, a very practical. It was not just one giant team effort, and I think that the United States is not that either. I mean, this was an, a, a, an area with a lot of disagreement, and it was healthy disagreement. I mean, that's how it's supposed to work, and that's how it worked here. It was creative disagreement. But it was led, as my understanding from reading your article, was led by a core group of men who understood how to get it done. Who were they, and how did they wind up being in control? Well, they were primarily two men from the New York City government, from an obscure agency called the Department of Design and Construction, Kenneth Holden and Mike Burton. Mike Burton. I didn't even know we had a Department of Design. And Many people didn't know that. Many within the government. Within the, within the city government, people, it's so obscure. They, these are people who normally were in charge of building municipal, or overseeing the building of municipal buildings and sidewalks, et cetera. They happened to be here. They were at a meeting at City Hall a few blocks away when the buildings were, came down. And they responded. These two men, Mike Burton and Ken, Ken Holden, uh, responded as best they could, not thinking of the future. And they were so effective at what they did. And the American system was so flexible in its response to them that they assumed, finally assumed power, and they were the ones who really ran the show down here. How it seems almost impossible to pull together these people who flooded down here to volunteer, to pull them together in any kind of coherent uh, effort seemed impossible at the time. Well, the volunteer effort very quickly was eased away from the, the core work. The, the, most of the work here from the very, very early days was professionalized. The people who were working here whether they were firemen, whether they were construction workers or engineers, they were the, often the best in their business. So these were not just volunteers. Now, they may have been volunteers, but after a while, there was a weeding that went on, and the, pe the, the people here were not in any sense amateurs. They were the opposite of amateurs. They were top in their field. We all remember, or we should remember, in the early going, people were working with bucket lines, buckets, right. to pull away the debris and carefully look for well, first survivors and then bodies. How did they manage to segue from that literal handwork to the huge machines that I came down here? I was struck by enormous machinery with the best of the best running it. The, the bucket brigades were more of a reflection on the emotion and on the intent than they were a practical, a practical tool. Um, and I think everyone down here realized that. Those on the bucket, bucket brigades realized it. They knew that they couldn't move this debris with buckets, not effectively. They simply didn't have the equipment in here. 
And we're not talking about little bobcats. As you say, this was the heaviest construction equipment that was needed, and it took a few days for the, for the equipment to get in here. In the meantime, the bucket brigades, people were doing the best they could. There were successes um, at that time, but um, it was a, a simple problem of bringing in the heavy equipment. It did happen. There were some bottlenecks. They were solved. Everyone knew what the solution had to be. The solution had to be mechanical power, and the mechanical power came in a big way. Bill, thank you very much. We thank look forward to the forthcoming articles, the last of which will be in Atlantic Monthly in October. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. We'll be back with more after this. When the assassins rammed the hijacked aircraft into the World Trade Center towers, no one had to tell the New York City firefighters of Ladder Company 6 that this call could be the last they ever answered. What actually took place in the hours that followed inside the towers is an astounding tale of bravery and survival. The rush of veil was incredible. Matt Komorowski hollered to his Ladder 6 colleagues to get moving. An incredible push at my back. They were still trying to get out of the North Tower when it started coming down. It was like boom, 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 very quickly. The captain, Jay Jonas, had been worrying they were moving too slowly. Now it was too late. These massive steel beams just flying all around our heads. It was bang, 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 and it just sped up. In a matter of 10 seconds, it sounded like a jackhammer. It sounded like I was on top of a jackhammer. And this was one floor coming down on top of the on other? On top of another, yes. At that point, did you think you were finished? Yeah. I, was, uh, I, I sat down and I thought of my wife and the kids and, and my family and that. Like so many other firehouses around New York City, Ladder 6 in Chinatown, not far from the World Trade Center, was in the midst of a shift change. Matt was standing outside, about to head home when the first plane flew overhead. I saw that it was an airliner. It was a, a large commercial airliner. Jonas and his men were already at the North Tower when the second plane hit. The captain was standing with an old friend. And he looked at me. And he says, Jay, we're going to be lucky if we survive this. I said, you're right. And then we all looked at each other. We winked and nodded our heads. We all said, good luck. And we went to work. Firemen react differently to danger than most people. They knew it was bad, but they went toward it. And the last thing I told them before we left is, this, they're trying to kill us, boys. Let's go. And without hesitation, every one of these guys looked at me and says, OK, Cap, we're with you. Inside the concrete and steel walls, Ladder 6 was moving up the stairs, crowded with people heading down. It was slow going. They got a quarter of the way up the tower when... We heard an earthquake-like rumble. We heard it and felt it. Our building swayed back and forth. And uh, the lights went out in our building for about 30 seconds. The other tower had collapsed. This is, all right, this is no longer uh, a workable mission. We can't do this. It's time for us to turn around and uh, start our evacuation. I knew we'd be, we'd be fortunate to get out in time. So I kept urging everybody to move a little faster. And they did, making good time, quickly moving 10 flights where they met Josephine Harris. And here, this becomes one of the most remarkable stories to come out of the World Trade Center. When did you come across Josephine? I think it was around the, uh, the 18th or 19th floor. Just looked like she was beat up, you know. I mean, uh, she, she had come down about 50, about 50 some floors at that point, and uh, she was walking very slowly. I think it was at that point that we promised her that we would get her out of the building, but we needed a little bit of help from her. And I'm getting tighter and tighter and weaker and weaker. Do you think you could have made it down below without the help of these men? No, I wouldn't have made it. The captain is con kept constantly prodding me, Billy, keep going with her. Let's keep, can you move a little faster with her? Here we are, moving very slowly, you know, and the captain just kept saying, let's go, keep moving, let's go. Somewhere around the 10th floor, I got a real strange feeling. This, this, is, uh, this, is, this is not good, you know, I want to get out of here now. On the fourth floor, Josephine actually stops. I remember hearing her say, stop, I got to catch my breaths. My leg just felt like it was, it had just had it. And I think I yelled out, I can't go anymore. 
And if not for her stopping at that point and slowing us down, we wouldn't be in that on that fourth floor. Josephine, you were moving as fast as you could. As fast as I could. But you just couldn't move any faster. And at that very moment, the tower collapsed. The 106 floors came crashing down toward them. The next thing I remember, I was, I, uh, I was sitting on the landing. I don't remember how I got down the stairs. Sal told me later on that I was just picked up and thrown down the stairs like a rag doll. And I wasn't sure if I was alive or dead. And when the smoke started clearing, the side of the staircase, the wall was missing. And that's when you could start seeing light from outside. And my first thought is I said, uh, I'm an enclosed staircase. How can I be seeing light? And that's, I guess, when it really hit me that, uh, you know, this building's down. The whole building really came down. Jay had uh, started calling out. He called out to us. What did he call out? Uh, he says, six truck. Six truck. He says, Mike. He called Tommy. He called us in succession, uh, you know, and we all answered him. I was very happy to hear their voices when I finally did get the roll call. At the time, I didn't know Josephine's name. I said, what about the woman? So yeah, she's still here. Once we grabbed Josephine, we were committed to her. She had become part of us. And later, they made her an honorary member of Ladder 6, complete with jacket. And it says, Josephine, our guardian angel. We're here to tell our story, but it, it, it's everybody's story. It's every fireman, every police officer who's working that day. It's the same story. They were all doing the same thing we were doing, except we were in that spot, and, and we were saved. There's no way to explain how we, you know, really we walked out of there. Uh, if we were a little faster, uh, we would have suffered the same fate of those who were in the lobby or immediately outside the building. Uh, if we were a little slower, uh, we would have suffered the same fate of, the, of those who were above us. So, true or untrue, the Josephine's pace happened to be, for whatever reason, just right. Just right. Just right. How can you explain it? Luck, fate, Josephine believes in her heart it was a higher power that allowed them to walk out of the belly of the beast. Captain Jonas has his own thought on that. God gave us the strength and the courage to intentionally put ourselves into harm's way to stop and save Josephine Harris. And little did we know, by us having the strength and courage to do that, we were saving ourselves. They were heroes, the men, mostly men, who ran into the burning towers one year ago, whose courage and dedication cost them their lives in so many cases. Yet this title, Hero, was somehow insufficient. They were men with homes and families with lawns to mow and bills to pay. But they did what they felt they had to do. Our coverage will continue. Fans, it's time to show your Big Orange spirit. In every away game this season, join in the fun at the Big Orange Tailgate Tour. The UT Alumni Department will throw a big party before every away game, and you're invited to come cheer on the balls with the pep band, the cheerleaders, fun and games, and much more. To find out when and where the Big Orange Tailgate Tour is making a stop near you, log on to VolunteerTV.com and click on Sports Overtime. It's brought to you by First USA, Hound Dogs, and WVLT Volunteer TV. The resolve of our great nation is being tested. Make no mistake, we will show the world that we will pass this test. Thank you for joining us on this special edition of Volunteer TV News this afternoon, September 11th, a year after a tragic day that will forever be in our minds. I'm Liz Tadone. One of Tennessee's U.S. Senators says the renewed sense of American pride will last long after today's memorials. Senator Bill Frist says America remains committed to do what is necessary to win the war on terrorism. Today, Frist is urging Americans to remember the more than 3,000 men and women and children who died in the attacks. Their loss must never be in vain. Instead, we should remember the courage and selflessness that showed the world what it really means to be an American. 
Meanwhile, former Vice President Al Gore's journalism students at Middle Tennessee State University questioned him to weigh in on the Bush administration's plans for a possible war against Iraq and today's nationwide security upgrade. In my opinion, there are good reasons for, for uh, overthrowing Saddam Hussein. There are also good questions that ought to be asked. Well, Gore is calling for a national debate to include the American public in any sort of decision to evade the Middle Eastern country. The city of Sevierville marked the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks yesterday with a special ceremony, but more events are planned for tonight. The Great Smoky Mountain Chamber of Commerce and Westgate Resorts are hosting a special candle lighting ceremony in Pigeon Forge. It's from 7 to 9 in the parking lot of the Music Mansion on the Parkway. Well, the bells at One Knoxville Church are ringing out today to remember the fallen. Just one part of very special services of remembrance at Second Presbyterian Church in Knoxville. This morning, people took time out for prayer and private reflection in memory of those who died in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania, and all those injured in the war on terrorism. Some say it's a different day, but a necessary day. The church bell will ring every 15 seconds throughout the day in honor of those who lost their lives. A candlelight vigil and prayer service is scheduled for 7.30 this evening. Shoes are used to spell out 9-11 at Knoxville's Lakeshore Park today. More than 3,000 shoes strategically clumped together, representing more than 3,000 people who were killed by the terrorist attacks on September 11th of last year. It's part of the United Way's Day of Caring. Ahead on WVLT Volunteer TV News at 5.30, we will show you just a few of the hundreds of projects being undertaken by East Tennesseans today. Also later today, beginning on our news hour at 5.30, we, how, we will show you how law agencies change the way they do business in East Tennessee since September 11th. And a lot of love came out of that horrible day. Tonight, meet the people who, stitch by stitch, crafted a memorial quilt in honor of that American spirit. Also, as I mentioned earlier, how thousands of East Tennesseans are taking part in the United Way's Day of Caring. So many people are doing so many good deeds. Our own news crew is out on site and will bring you their report. We'll see you back here today, later at 5.30 on WVLT, Volunteer TV News, and CBS. Try and make it a good day. This CBS News special report is part of our continuing coverage of 9-11, the day that changed America. From Ground Zero in New York, here is Dan Rather. And welcome back to CBS News continuing coverage of this first anniversary of the attacks on America. I'm here with Ed Bradley at Ground Zero in New York City. Along with following the day-long events and ceremonies marking 9-11, we're trying also to look at the larger picture of our beloved United States of America one year later. This half hour, Ed Bradley and I, along with our team of CBS News correspondents around the world, will examine the ongoing terrorist threats facing the United States and the steps being taken to bolster the nation's security. Nowhere in this country is security of greater concern than here in New York, understandably so. And coming up, United States Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton will join us to talk about that. We'll also discuss air travel and what is and is not being done to counter the possibility of biological, chemical, and of greatest concern, nuclear attack. Now, here are some of the events coming up later this afternoon and this evening at about 4.55 Eastern Time, that would be 3.55 Central Time Zone. Just over two hours from now, President Bush will be arriving here at Ground Zero. The president will take part in a wreath-laying ceremony. It's expected he may meet with family members. He is not expected at this point to make any remarks or give a speech during that time. That's late this afternoon. Then it's sunset, about 7.11 Eastern time. There'll be a ceremony in Battery Park at the southern tip of Manhattan. That's where the city has relocated the heavily damaged sphere sculpture that once stood in the World Trade Center Plaza. New York City's new mayor, Michael Bloomberg, will speak on that occasion, and an eternal flame will be lit. Attending many of these ceremonies today and joining us now is a person with a unique vantage point on the events of 9-11 and the anniversary, the junior senator from New York and former first lady of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Good afternoon, Senator. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, Dan. In your opinion, what is the most important change that has taken place in America in the past year? I think that we have 
understood our vulnerabilities in this uh, global economy and world that we now inhabit and that we've had to become more vigilant. We've had to take some steps for increasing our security that a year and a day ago would have seemed unlikely, uh, if not impossible. In the immediate hours and days after these terrible events happened, the overwhelming voice from Washington was, we will give New York, we will provide what you need, everything you need. Has that been provided? Yes, and I am very grateful for the support from the Congress, from the President, and from the American people. As you can see behind us, uh, we didn't think we'd get that terrible sight uh, of destruction cleared and the debris removed in less than a year, and we did it. Uh, we didn't, I didn't, but the construction workers and the guys who were down there working 24 hours a day did, and they did it uh, ahead of schedule and below budget. So we have been very grateful for the help we've received, but there's a lot of work ahead of us, and we're going to be probably needing more help. Senator, the President of the United States is asking you and every other senator, every member of Congress to support him for a new war against Iraq. Will you vote yay? Dan, I want to see what the President actually asks for. You know, we've had a lot of um, speeches and news appearances made, discussions about the threat that Iraq poses. There's no doubt that all of us who have studied this issue now for a decade understand Saddam Hussein and weapons of mass destruction are not a combination we can afford to permit to exist in our world. So there isn't any doubt about the goal, which is to change the regime in Iraq for the Iraqi people as well as the rest of us. But the president will be starting tomorrow um, to lay out a plan as to how best to do that and to answer some of the questions that must be addressed. You know, this is uh, not just an isolated action. It has repercussions with respect to our ongoing war against terrorism, what we're doing in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, our economy. There's a lot of issues that have to be addressed. Senator, I've heard, and I know you must have heard, and I read from time to time, people who are on the opposite, direct opposite side of the political spectrum say, you know, the Bill Clinton presidency has a lot to answer for. And in some cases, they just say directly, this wouldn't have happened if he'd have been doing his job. Now, he was the president, you weren't. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? Well, that usually comes from people who, um, you know, are, are very critical on every front. And the facts just don't support that. Based on everything I know, uh, the administration uh, under my husband's presidency took a lot of action uh, to try to deal with terrorism as we understood it. You know, terrorists were rounded up. They were brought to justice. The people who bombed the World Trade Center were imprisoned. Uh, many terrorist attacks were foiled and prevented. Uh, but clearly, uh, what happened here a year ago changed everything. It, it certainly changed the attitude of the American people and the Congress about what we would or would not be willing to do. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine that we're now very patiently standing in long lines being you know, willing to be uh, examined before we get on airplanes, that there are many issues that were really off the table about uh, privacy, surveillance, and the like that are now, you know, considered part of the war on terror. So could we have done more if uh, we had lived in a world of perfect information? I have no doubt about that, all the way up until the moment those planes hit on September the 11th. But I think that it's more fruitful, uh, which is what most of us on both sides of the aisle are doing, uh, to look ahead and say, how do we make sure this never happens again? Because there are no more excuses. We have no illusions about the adversaries that face us. Senator Hillary Rodham, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Dan. Today's events are unfolding against an ominous backdrop. An officially heightened state of alert, or code orange, declared just yesterday on instructions of the president by the attorney general. Cited were what were called credible evidence and testimony that some sort of terror attack on U.S. interests may be in the works overseas or possibly here. CBS's Jim Stewart in Washington has been working his sources and has the latest on this. Jim? Well, Dan, this intelligence breakthrough apparently comes through what uh, in jailhouse parlance might be called a, uh, a, an inmate who has started to sing. Uh, U.S. officials have gotten their hands on another senior terrorist leader. This one apparently captured some months ago, perhaps in Java. It's not clear. One report has identified him as a man named Omar al Farak. U.S. officials have not confirmed that name. He is apparently being held overseas at an undisclosed location, although yesterday Philippine authorities seemed to indicate that he was being held there. In any event, he joins two other men, one named Al-Libya and the other Abu Zubaydah, as 
the three highest ranking uh, Al Qaeda or Al Qaeda related uh, suspects in custody and they are talking. Their information is being put together with what interrogators are getting from the people in Guantanamo who are the lower level soldiers and that is being added to a an, an absolute warehouse full of material that continues to pour almost daily out of Afghanistan. Let me give you some idea of what we're talking about. There are hundreds of boxes uh, being uh, looked at now in the basement of the FBI that contain materials uh, ranging from videotapes to the contents of wallets to what authorities are calling, frankly, uh, pocket trash. This is literally the materials being taken from the corpses on the battlefield and from the suspects being taken into custody. And they're looking at all this and coming up with a picture of what they think al-Qaeda might be up to in the future. The question, of, as always, Dan, though, is one of timing and timeliness. Uh, two days ago, they came across some timely information, and as a result, we're at Code Orange right now. Dan? Jim Stewart, live in Washington. Last September 11th, the first fact of life that changed for all Americans everywhere was the nature of air travel. Commercial jets, historically among the safest ways to travel, had become, in the hands of terrorists, weapons of destructive power. CBS News transportation correspondent Bob Orr has more now on what this meant for the aviation industry and for you. Bob? Well, Dan, the attacks last September 11th were devastating. One of the things that they did, they caused the first ever shutdown of the complete U.S. aviation system. The airplanes resumed flying in three days, as you remember, but a year later, the industry has not fully recovered. And the airlines are struggling now to balance security, service, and solvency. A year after 9-11, there are fewer passengers and flights, but more hassles as the U.S. aviation industry struggles to tighten security and restore confidence. Hundreds of new air marshals have been hired, and thousands of cockpit doors have been reinforced to thwart hijackers. Federally trained screeners are replacing private security forces, and by mid-November will be in all U.S. airports. But the hard part is still ahead. There's simply not enough room in this space to put the trace detection. Jeff Fagan, who runs the DFW airport in Dallas, says major U.S. airports will face huge delays if a year-end deadline stands, requiring that all checked bags be scanned for bombs. So what we're going to find is that the, uh, the passengers will not only line up through this circulation, but also find themselves circulating out, out the door. But Transportation Secretary and Norm Mineta is not us. backing off the mandate. So at those airports, you will still screen every bag. We will, that's right, but it'll, it may take an hour and a half, two hours to do it. Congress now is considering a deadline extension and at the same time is pushing a reluctant Bush administration to permit guns in the cockpit. Under pressure from the NRA and pilots' unions, the House and Senate have passed bills calling for the pilots to be armed. If you're going to stop another September 11th, and you're going to stop pilots from being murdered if the cockpit is breached. How are you going to do it? It all comes down to that for us, and there's really only one way. Now, today has been a quiet day across America. Hundreds of flights have been canceled. Thousands of passengers have stayed home. There is one potential security incident that's still being investigated in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Here's what happened. A Northwest airliner took off uh, this morning from Memphis bound for Las Vegas. It was flight 979. Shortly after takeoff, passengers noticed three other passengers acting very strangely. They told the flight crew. Eventually, we're told, these three passengers locked themselves in one of the bathrooms aboard the plane. The pilot then made a decision to divert the plane and landed safely at Fort Smith, Arkansas. The FBI is still investigating and questioning those three men and also questioning a fourth person. We're not sure how the fourth person might be related, but in any case, federal officials tell us preliminarily, Dan, that this does not appear to be a terrorism incident or a terrorism-related incident, but they're on a hair trigger for any potential security problems. Bob Orr, reporting live from Reagan National Airport outside Washington. When it comes to airport security, some of the most intense scrutiny has focused on the place air travelers know as LAX, or sometimes LAX, the Los Angeles International Airport, and for good reason. Joining us from Los Angeles now with more on that is correspondent Sandra Hughes. Sandra. Los Angeles International Airport is unique. Not only were three of the hijacked airplanes headed here, but it's also been a target of Al-Qaeda before. It's not the biggest airport in the country, but Salt Lake City International is the most progressive. 
it was the first to screen every piece of checked baggage. Please go to the shortest lines for security check. Now the city that saw the Winter Olympics through safely is designing what will likely be the first major airport to include all post-September 11th security requirements built from the ground up. What we've had to do is go in since 9-11 and widen out this security checkpoint to accommodate the additional lanes. Following the attacks, airport manager Tim Campbell was forced to redesign plans for a new airport. It became obvious that we needed to go back in and make some changes in our uh, concept that we had put together. Double the number of security lanes. Plans to put those minivan-sized explosive detection machines behind the ticket counter. Those changes don't come cheaply or easily. The cost of the new airport is likely to now be more than a billion dollars and take an additional two years to build. But it may be worth the price. This is Chicago's Midway Airport, a $500 million state-of-the-art facility opened just before 9-11. But new security requirements keep moving walkways still, and people are often backed up everywhere. It's been a challenge. Airport spokesperson Monique Bond says the industry is struggling to get up to speed. 429 airports across the country are having to look at some of the challenges that we're faced with as far as having to make the airport work. Tell them to get with the program or what? Be fined? Be shut down. Salt Lake City Mayor Rocky Anderson contends the Transportation Security Administration is still too disorganized. If you do everything you can, and somebody gets through the system, people understand that. What the people of this country won't understand and won't forgive is that if there is a major terrorist attack, and once again, it's because of the failure of our federal agencies. Requests for an interview with the TSA by CBS News went unanswered. Knives, sharp objects. No one underestimates the monumental job of overhauling airport security. But nearly everyone agrees, whether building new airports or retrofitting the old ones. One year later, there is still a lot more to be done. Maureen Maher, CBS News, Salt Lake City. Now, after that report by Maureen Maher, we're going to go back to Los Angeles International Airport and pick up Sandra Hughes Live. Sandra? Well, Dan, as we were saying, LAX has some unique problems, and we're going to tell you about those in this story. If you want to make a point, uh, penetrating LAX is definitely making a statement. Security consultant Joe Noller knows it too well. His friend and former employee Victoria Hen died here at LAX on July 4th, shot at the LL ticket counter by an Egyptian man in an incident that was a startling reminder of how insecure airports can still be. It was devastating both because I knew it was going to happen. I didn't know when. The FBI will not completely characterize that shooting, which claimed one other life before LL Al security agents killed the gunman, as terrorism, saying Hasham Muhammad Hadayat acted alone. That doesn't satisfy Noller. Well, times have changed. And unfortunately, you have people out there which are individuals and do not work under groups. And LAX has been a target of terrorist groups as well. Just before the year 2000 celebration, law enforcement agents broke up another alleged plot by an Al-Qaeda operative to blow up the airport. There's a sense of urgency about what we're doing at Los Angeles International Airport. LAX is leading the nation's airports in some respects, installing some 1,200 video cameras in the terminals and on the tarmac. But the sense of urgency has tried the patience of the traveling public at times. LAX has had among the highest number of terminal evacuations in the past year. None of those ever amounted to anything except the one after the July 4th shooting when the damage was already done. It lets us know that there are vulnerabilities. Duh. We need security at the ticket counters. California Senator Barbara Boxer called a hearing at LAX this summer to tell California airport officials that they need to make some security issues a priority. For her part, Boxer is pushing for new equipment on planes, too, like this bomb-proof baggage container, which might help prevent a catastrophe like this. Now, even though 
travel has dropped here at LAX since September 11th by 15 percent. There are more baggage and cargo loaded on and off planes here than any other airport in the world, and that causes a major security concern. Dan. Sandra Hughes reporting live from Los Angeles International Airport. What's happening now is that President Bush is on his way from Shanksville, Pennsylvania, to here in New York. He'll make an appearance later in the afternoon here at Ground Zero. No plans for the president to make a public address during that period. His address to the nation comes at 9, 8 central tonight. Of course, CBS News will cover it. That'll be just after Scott Pelley's exclusive interview with the president and others about what happened hour by hour on 9-11 last year. Now, here's Ed Bradley. Well, I'm just thinking it's, uh, it's, it's good that most of the people are gone from behind us now because you couldn't see them. The wind is, is blowing that dust up so much. I hope it just comes down by the, by the time President Bush gets here. You know, Dan, shortly after 9-11, America found itself facing another crisis and another fear. It was called bioterrorism. Letters containing deadly anthrax were being sent through the mail. Joey Chen has more on the bioterror threat and how America is facing it. Joey? And it has now been almost a year since the first anthrax victim was diagnosed, and there is still no indication that there's any connection between those contaminated letters and September 11th. Still coming as they did in the wake of that assault, it just underscores the terrorist's ability to strike on many fronts. Whoever launched the anthrax attacks proved a basic truth of bioterrorism. It doesn't take much to cause a panic. Six letters, no more than a few ounces of dried powder bearing the lethal spores, but five deaths and still no suspect has forced the nation to face up to a shocking vulnerability. Is this sort of an acknowledgement that that was one of the things that was missing for you guys? Sure it was. It was a, it was a weakness. At the command center, an unlikely general, Health and Human Services Secretary Tommy Thompson, who admits officials failed to get the right information out quickly. Nobody really ever expected, you know, that the Department of Health and Human Services was going to have to fight this war of bioterrorism. Thompson says neither he nor the doctors on the front line knew all they needed to know. And so the nation began a steep learning and spending curve. I'm exposed. I'm exposed. Dozens of disaster drills now train first responders to look for signs of chemical and biological attack. Communities have developed elaborate decontamination plans. Congress spent more than a billion dollars to help local governments and federal health officials to better coordinate and track medical emergencies. The government stockpile of antibiotics and other medical supplies for a bioterror crisis has grown 50 percent. The supply of smallpox vaccine has multiplied even faster. Just 15 million doses a year ago, the country will have 300 million doses available by the end of this year. But is the nation ready? So we have enough vaccine to protect every man, woman, and child in the United States. The only problem we have is we don't have a plan how to distribute it quickly. An even greater concern may be indifference, that the nation will let down its guard. Do you think this country will face another bioterrorist I think you got a, I think you got a plan on it. I think it's, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, terrorists that uh, we have all over the world and even in America. You gotta, you gotta anticipate that there's gonna be another attack. So what will it be? Another anthrax attack, possibly smallpox, the plague, Ebola, any of those things possible. But Thompson says what he is most concerned about right now is the possibility that someone might try to contaminate the nation's food supply. Ed? Joey Chin in our Washington Bureau. What all this really comes down to, the bottom line questions for most Americans are these. Are we truly safer now than we were a year ago? And what more needs to be done? For some answers, we're joined by Randy Larson, the director of the uh, Answer Institute for Homeland Security. Good afternoon, Colonel. Yeah, yeah. You, you've said that the greatest threat to U.S. security does not come in the form of a nuclear missile, but in a test tube. Can you explain that? That's correct. And we saw that. CBS saw it firsthand back in October last year, the same problem we had in the United States Senate, House of Representatives. Most people do not see this as something that looks like a weapon of mass destruction, but it is. It's part of the 21st century. It's like a cell phone becomes a global command and control system. This is a weapon of mass destruction. This is harmless, but 
Genetically, it's nearly identical to Bacillus anthracis, the bacteria that causes anthrax. When Vice President Cheney asked me the question last October, what does a weapon, what does a biological weapon look like? I said, sir, it looks like this, and I just carried it into your office past the Secret Service. This is an entirely new weapon system that we have to be prepared to deal with. In some respects, we are much better prepared for a biological attack today than we were a year ago. In many other areas, though, we have a long way to go in proper preparation. What are the other threats we face in addition to anthrax? Nuclear weapons, of course, but that's probably the most remote one. It's catastrophic consequences, but very remote. The radiological dispersal device, not an actual fissionable or fusion event, but the radiological dispersal device, the dirty bomb that would be economic damage to a city, might not be able to go back into a building for years, or you may have to tear the building down to clean it up. Chemical weapons are very small, and are like a truck bomb. It would be very a tactical weapon that could cause a lot of problem in a subway system, but not to a city or a state. So we hear all of this talk about a dirty bomb. What is it, and how real is the threat? Well, we know that the British troops found Cobalt-60 in an Al-Qaeda camp. That's something that's used in hospitals and nuclear treatment facilities. Probably dozens of hospitals in this town have it. All you do is take some regular explosive, like Timothy McVeigh did, or even Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. You take some of that Cobalt-60, wrap it in that, blow it up. The explosion would do most of the killing. No one would die from the radiation. The common phrase is the more people would die of heart attacks when they heard it on the radio and TV, there'd been a radiological dispersal device. It could cause cancer 10, 15 years from now. The real problem is the economic cleanup. David Martin reported earlier that they were concerned about a ship that had come for, to the New York port. They had taken it six miles off the New Jersey coast because of some readings they were getting. There's 650 containers on that ship. So uh, the, the point of that is that it's not hard to get something into this country. And 16 million of those containers come into this country every year. We inspect less than 2% of it. The good news of that story is we detected it, and we put it out off the coast so we can be safe. Today, there are 4,000 federal officers carrying little radiological detectors on their belts in our ports, seaports and airports. They look like a beeper. They're there to detect that. By the end of this fall, we'll have 8,500 of those detectors in ports and entry places around this country. So that's a good news story that we caught that ship this morning. We've seen in the Middle East car bombings, suicide bombers. Is that a threat to our country? I think it is, but it's not the sort of threat that we worry about of the catastrophic sorts of weapons of mass destruction. That will not destroy our economy. It will not change our civil liberties. That's why the Bush administration said we have to focus our priorities on those weapons that threaten us the most. Biological is the highest priority. Colonel Washington, thank you very much for joining yeah. us. You're watching continuing CBS News coverage of 9-11, the day that changed America. The most recent mainstream medical study about alternative medicine shows patients in the U.S. spend $21 billion during visits to alternative medicine practitioners. Tomorrow at noon, meet a few women who say integrating a few alternative techniques can help make you healthier. And a proposal to build a park in northwest Knoxville comes up before the Metropolitan Planning Commission. It's an idea already facing some opposition. We'll have a preview. Join us for those stories and more tomorrow on WVLT Volunteer TV News at noon. I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people... Hello and welcome to a special edition of WVLT Volunteer TV News. I'm Liz Tadone. The attacks of September 11th immediately created security concerns at Department of Energy facilities in Oak Ridge. Some of the DOE buildings store nuclear materials. Others are home to highly sensitive research. WVLT Volunteer TV's Bob Yarbrough shows us that even though security at the facilities has increased, the real changes are on the inside. Security is the most obvious post 9-11 change at the Department of Energy facilities. We have a very important national asset and we've always put a lot of emphasis on protecting that. Bethel Valley Road leads to the Oak Ridge National Lab and was turned from public to private soon after the attacks. A 24-hour security portal now stands guard to the lab. You'll find the real post 9-11 changes a few miles inside those security gates. And while the changes may not be visible to the naked eye, they're quickly gaining worldwide attention. The sense of urgency and the pride of the, of the researchers, I think they understand it's very personal now after 9-11. The two signals 
are another degree of specificity. Many ideas developed before the attacks are now reworked with our nation's security in mind. And we have the infrastructure to do this and the expertise, the people, uh, a lot of equipment, and we'd like to put it to use to protect our country. Technology designed to detect if explosives are present at an airplane crash site can now determine if a passenger has recently handled explosives. Contamination to an area's water supply can now be detected almost instantly. This research was originally done for an industrial purpose. So what we're hoping here is you have one small part of the puzzle where all of the parts taken together can give us comprehensive protection. A new way of thinking possibly leading to a new sense of security inspired by a day that was quite the opposite. Bob Yarbrough, WVLT, Volunteer TV News. Well, several hundred of those Oak Ridge federal workers who are responsible for our national security marked the 9-11 anniversary this morning with an observance ceremony. They gathered outside DOE's federal office building for a flag raising and a moment of silence for those who lost their lives on this day last year. Meanwhile, another American flag flew at half staff. I mean, I think it helps us remember. It helps us remember those families, helps us remember what our country's all about, and most important, I think it helps us to get behind our leaders as far as the decisions that are going to be hard in the future. Members of the Oak Ridge High School Band and the Farragut High School Color Guard participated in DOE's 9-11 program. Well, people in Blunt County are also paying tribute to those who lost their lives on 9-11. Many gathered this morning at the New Providence Presbyterian Church in Maryville. The bell rang out at 8.46, the exact moment when the first plane struck the North Tower. The sanctuary was also open all morning long so people could pay their respects and quietly reflect on that day one year ago. Stay tuned to WVLT and Volunteer TV News and CBS for more coverage throughout the day. This CBS News special report is part of our continuing coverage of 9-11, the day that changed America. From Ground Zero in New York, here is Dan Rather. To his fellow Americans, the night of 9-11, President George W. Bush said, and I quote, America was targeted for attack because we are the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world, and no one will keep that light from shining. Indeed, it is shining brightly this day, and in that spirit, in this half hour, we'll have a remarkable tale from the underground, a story of heroism and survival in the New York subway beneath Ground Zero one year ago. Ed Bradley, who's with me here downtown New York at Ground Zero, and I will also have reports on the compensation funds for families of the 9-11 victims, and we'll show you how some of the youngest family members are struggling to cope with their loss. He was doing a job few New York City commuters gave a thought to, driving a subway train. But one year later, he's a hero many subway riders will think of often and never forget because he saved their lives on September 11th by disobeying orders. CBS News correspondent Byron Pitts has his story. Byron? Well, Dan, his name is Hector Ramirez. He's a subway driver for New York City. This morning, he was one of the 197 people who read the names of the victims here at Ground Zero. Hector Ramirez is a good man with a good story. There were so many heroes on September 11th, and many of their stories have been told. But not this one. This one was underground, literally. I just saw a lot of people, a lot of people waving. Uh, they had, their faces were covered with a cloth and material. On September 11th, Hector Ramirez was driving his subway train towards Ground Zero when the attacks occurred. These people, these people are scared. Over the radio, Ramirez was given a direct order. Do not stop at the World Trade Center. Smelling smoke and sensing danger, Ramirez ignored the order. But the order was to keep going. Yes. So why'd you stop? There was no way I was going to leave those people there. These were people who were running for their lives, now trapped in the subway line with nowhere left to run. I remember coming to the station, there was one woman in particular, she had a cloth over her face. I've never seen that kind of fear in anybody's eyes. She was scared that I was going to leave her. Ramirez put the woman and everyone else on the platform aboard his train and drove to safety. 
weeks later, as these pictures show, investigators discovered steel beams had cut deep into the subway line. It's presumed had anyone still been inside the tunnel when the towers collapsed, they too would have died, if not for Hector Ramirez. It still hurts. I mean, the idea of thousands of people going to work one morning and not coming home. Uh, you and your colleagues save lives. Do you feel like a hero? No, not by any measure. On September 11th, New York Transit did not lose a single passenger or employee. As Hector Ramirez put it, we did our job as best we could. Ramirez did his job with a heavy heart. Hours would pass before he would find out if his wife was safe. Maria Ramirez also worked near Ground Zero, and Hector couldn't reach her by phone. But eventually, they met at home. What was that reunion like when you finally did see your wife again? Very quiet. We just held each other in the doorway when I finally got, got to her. We just held each other in the doorway and um, it was just quiet for a while. Hector Ramirez says that September 11th taught him many lessons. Always hug his wife before he leaves for work. Remember the small things in life. Dan, it is a lesson many of us learned from September 11th. Byron Pitts, in the bright sunshine, but with the wind increasing in strength here at Ground Zero in Manhattan. For some of the families touched by 9-11, this tragedy has carried an especially high cost, emotional to be sure, but also financial. A fund was set up to help compensate the families, but as CBS's Richard Schlesinger reports now, the fund has generated both interest and controversy. When he was killed, Jenna Jacobs' husband, Ari, was on the fast track to a high-profile, high-paying job in the tech industry. Each time the jump was from salesman to regional VP to senior vice president to CEO, and next he was supposed to have an official seat on the board. Ari Jacobs was just 29. He was making a comfortable living, but he had the potential to make an extraordinary living. How do you put a dollar value on a loved one's life? It's never been easy, but the federal government got into that business after the terror attacks. It set up a multi-billion dollar compensation fund for victims' families. It's a source of income for families that lost their breadwinners. It is also a source of contention over who gets how much and under what conditions. Come and get the doggies. Jenna Jacobs is thinking of applying for money from the fund. Good boy. The big picture for me is to be able to keep my home, which my husband and I bought together. The fund was set up by Congress in the weeks following the attacks as part of a deal to finance loan guarantees for the airline industry. Special Master Kenneth Feinberg will decide how much each family will get. The program, in a sense, is a social safety net. This is a unique expression, I think, of taxpayer public generosity. So who gets what? Congress set up a complex formula that considers a victim's potential lifetime earnings plus pain and suffering minus the amount of money families receive from life insurance and other benefits. It sounds somewhat crass. That's what's the problem here so soon after September 11th. But we've got a formula, and we're sticking to that formula. Feinberg will give out anywhere from 300000 to several million dollars per family. The money is tax-free, but not catch-free. One of the biggest catches, in exchange for a quick settlement with the fund, families must give up the right to sue the airlines or anyone else except the terrorists themselves for me to shut up fund. It's a what? Shut up fund. Monica Gabriel became an activist soon after she became a widow last year. Although she believes the fund is designed to pay off the families to protect the airlines. You take the money, you don't have any recourse in the, in the courts to get answers, and um, hopefully you just go away. The criticism is that your fund is designed to get people to take this money in exchange for shutting up. I haven't really heard that. I have heard some say that by going into a lawsuit, they increase the likelihood of getting information about what happened on September 11th. I don't believe that. A lot of families, for a lot of reasons, have joined Monica Gabriel and have so far stayed away from the fund. Fewer than 700 claims have been filed, and only a handful of checks have been mailed out. 
Feinberg says a lot of families are still too grief-stricken to apply. I got it. Jenna Jacobs is still eyeing the compensation fund, looking at the amounts other families have received and putting her faith in a man she does not know. He has complete control over our financial destinies, and I hope that, that he considers that when making the awards. Considering her loss, money won't be much comfort, but it could be some help. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. Some of the deepest scars of 9-11 are on the minds and hearts of the youngest survivors, the children. Dr. Emily Sine joins us with a look at some youngsters whose own growing pains include grief. Doctor? Good afternoon, Dan. Well, a recent survey finds that 93% of children under 14 in New York City were either actual eyewitnesses to the attack or saw the images of the towers collapsing on television. Nearly half those kids are still having emotional problems related to 911. We spoke with several families around New York, including seven children in one family who lost their father. It's Ryan's turn. The Fisher children lost their father when the Twin Towers collapsed. John Fisher was a Port Authority security consultant who tried to help people escape. I was in denial. I thought he, I thought he was still alive. Sometimes I thought that I saw him in church or something around town. I couldn't call up my dad and tell him that I loved him and that I was sorry for fighting and that I had no chance to say any last words. The children were able to find peace of mind at a bereavement camp called the Comfort Zone. The kids had the opportunity to share and, and even if they're not comfortable sharing, they're still going to identify with somebody else who's going to say something that they can relate to the type of loss or where they were when they heard or maybe they're having a bad, bad dreams at night. Yeah, it helped a lot. Like, it, I don't know, all of my feelings just, I let it all out. I've been able to kind of evolve and just grow and learn that my father knows that I love him. And he knows that I care about him and he knows that I wish that we didn't fight. It's almost as if day really did turn into yeah. that black Something, night. Yeah. Sharing their feelings through art has helped many other New York City children cope. Child psychologist Robin Goodman helped put together an art exhibit illustrating children's feelings about the events of September 11th. What the kids do in their art is they personalize this experience. There are kids that before were fine and now are not because of the events of 9-11. Which kids were at biggest risk for problems related to 911? We know that some kids are more at risk regardless of the type of trauma based on their exposure in terms of seeing it and witnessing it or whether they were physically and emotionally affected if somebody died. Twelve-year-old Patrick Duhaney of Brooklyn was an eyewitness to the attack. I saw as the plane came and hit the tower, I saw um, the tower collapsing. Patrick, he couldn't sleep because first thing he said to me, he said, you know, I remember my mom because she died when I was eight, six. He said, and all those kids that lost their parents. I felt devastated. My, my, at that time, I felt crushed and destroyed. Patrick got help at the Bedford-Stuyvesant Family Health Center. They provided counseling sessions for more than 100 children. Coming to the center helps. Being in the classes, it, that really helps. And then I had a whole bunch of people that were there to talk to me. That helped. Bless us, O Lord, for these thy gifts which we are about. The challenge to is to help kids out. find optimism in the face of tragedy. We like take care of each other more, a lot more than before. Um, I think it was a struggle, sort of, but a good struggle, one that you learn from. A survey conducted in March revealed that 10% of New York City kids suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and 25% experienced depression, anxiety, or other symptoms of emotional distress. Dan, one-third of New York City children have received some sort of therapy or emotional assistance to get them through this. Councilor Ney, thanks. We have much more ahead as our coverage of 9-11, the day that changed America, rolls on, so stay here with us.